Well, hi all, I am Michael Morella, Managing Editor of Events at US News and World Report. Thank you and welcome to today's webinar on Rethinking the Future of Health, Innovations from COVID-19. Today's session is the latest installment in our ongoing Healthcare of Tomorrow series, which is a virtual program geared towards hospital and health system leaders to discuss common priorities and emerging solutions on the future of the nation's health system. I encourage you to explore the videos, recap articles from past events, as well as our upcoming programs at usnews.com slash healthcare of tomorrow. Just a couple of quick notes. We are capturing video of today's session and we'll be making that available to those who registered. Look for an email from our team. We are also live casting on the US News Facebook page. If you have questions and you're watching on Zoom, we ask you to please type those into the Q&A feature on your screen. Our team will review those and give voice to some of them over the course of the hour. Now I will get to our panel. We're very pleased to introduce uh, the guests we have with us today. They are Rita Khan, Chief Digital Officer at Mayo Clinic, Kevin Mahoney, Chief Executive Officer of the University of Pennsylvania Health System, Dr. Sema Sagayer, Co-Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Sergo Ventures, and John Talaga, Executive Vice President of Healthcare at Flywire. Welcome all, thanks for being with us. Now I will turn it over to Brian Kelly, Editorial Director and Executive Vice President of US News and World Report. Brian. Thank you, Michael. Welcome everyone. Appreciate you taking the time on a busy, busy day, always a busy day in this industry. Um, very pleased to have, uh, as, as we enjoy a, a broad cross-section of folks from, from key parts of this industry. Um, the topic today, as Michael mentioned, it's innovation in a post-COVID world. Um, we set this uh, theme a number of months ago when I suspect things were a little bleaker for most people. Um, certainly in very recently, uh, the landscape has changed in a favorable direction, although not it's not over, we think, we know, um, but we do think it's a really opportune time to begin to ask these key questions about what did we learn as an industry uh, from COVID? Where were the shortcomings? Where were the takeaways uh, that, that showed us uh, new innovative ways to move forward? Um, where will we go from here? Um, and my last question I can tell everyone now is going to be what happens in the next pandemic? Have we figured that one out yet? So. Um, remarkable period in history and, and uh, professionally for so many folks in this industry. I'm very pleased to be able to play a part um, in, in convening uh, great, talented people. Um, and let me start with, uh, speaking of great, talented people, let me start with Kevin Mahoney from Penn Med, a, one of uh, the uh, perpetual U.S. News top hospitals, a hospital that I have a deep personal affection for because you saved my mother's life at Penn Med, Kevin. Uh, one of your brilliant uh, cardiac surgeons did a very complicated surgery on her late in her life, and uh, she came through uh, winningly, and uh, I will always be grateful. Um, and you're probably going to send me a fundraising appeal, but that's okay, too. Uh, so uh, not to make it too personal, but it is all personal. But Kevin, so, you know, coming from one of the great medical institutions in the country, um, give us a sense of an overview sense of, of how Penn Med has navigated this and, and where, where you see yourself coming out. Yeah. So thank you, Brian, and, and I'm glad your, your mom did well. And I'll hold off on the, um, the donation appeal. But uh, Penn Medicine, you know, I, I think like the rest of the nation's health system, it, it was a period of a crisis. It was a period of people coalescing uh, against a common enemy. And what I admired most about the, the approach that everyone took clinically and technology and innovation was the rapid iteration of how quickly we learned about the disease, how to treat it, how to move forward. So we had a very hospital-centric approach in the beginning. We bought, for example, $400,000 worth of ventilators that I never used because we quickly, we thought everybody needed to be on a mechanical ventilation. We quickly found out that was absolutely the wrong thing to do. So we went from how do we treat these patients as hospital centric to how do we treat the patient, including remotely at, at home using what we called COVID watch, which was an app for monitoring people remotely. 
And, and I think we learned a lot as to we can perform Penn Medicine's mission at home and, and increasingly in the virtual environment. And, and that, that's a takeaway that, that we'll have for a long time. Yeah, fascinating. And I, I, I wanted Rita, I'm gonna to turn to Rita Khan at, at Mayo Clinic. Gee, another amazing uh, medical institution. Um, pleased to have you with us, Rita. You, you have an interesting role there because you're involved in the communication side, the patient interaction side. You see lots of different parts of the institution. Um, but, but just homing in just on Kevin's point about this um, care at home, I know a big piece of what Mayo's done. Tell, tell me a little bit about the Mayo experience and, and, and how you leaned into some of the, the changes that were already underway. Yeah, like Kevin, uh, we really were focusing on and, and feeling an impact uh, on the need to accelerate. Um, so we had lots of uh, strategies in place uh, leading up in 2019 uh, to advance our digital solutions. Um, uh, including advanced care at home. So we had plans before the pandemic to have a hospital in the home um, set up. And because of our need to support new use cases, rather than um, putting those pilots on hold, we really started to activate um, those solutions so that we could extend our care. Um, we had tremendous learnings um, from our rural um, uh, implementation of that pilot, as well as our urban implementation of that pilot. Uh, and because of those learnings, we are accelerating those um, programs into our Arizona campus. And so um, I think what was really important for us to understand and to learn from is that um, despite the challenges of being very focused on the, the challenges at hand, innovation can help extend and solve for access challenges um, and support use cases while delivering quality um, real time. Um, so it was a great challenge, but it proved that we really could um, adjust to the needs of the patient and adjust to the needs of our communities. Good, I, I wanna come back to that. I mean, during COVID, I created an office in my home, a health club in my home and a bar and grill in my home, but not a hospital, um, oh, thankfully. But uh, I think we probably need to do some more on that front in any event. John, uh, tell us, you're coming from a little different perspective on this as, as being, you know, servicing a number of major hospitals and, and dealing with their customers uh, on, on very tricky questions of, of payment, billing, et cetera. Um, tell us what, what Flywheel has learned through this, Flywire, I'm sorry, has learned through this uh, very you know, trying period for both your company and your customers. Yeah, so you know, over the past several years, I think you know, a, lot of, a lot of people understand that patient liability has taken on a much greater share of the overall net patient revenue at a hospital due to high deductible health plans. And this has created really an affordability crisis for patients. And uh, it's really, it's resulted in a downstream impact on provider collectability as well in, in many cases, consumers avoiding care altogether due to cost. So um, the financial strain that the pandemic has had on consumers has really only exasperated the problem that was already there. And it's, it's really driving a whole new level of urgency to address these, these issues. And you know, our healthcare mission at Flywire, a um, little commercial, um, is really to modernize the patient payment experience to make it easier and more affordable for patients to pay uh, while improving performance for the provider. And our software drives, drives these type of outcomes in a couple key ways. We apply predictive analytics and machine learning to address the patient's capacity to pay. So how much can they afford at the time of the billing events? And then uh, what we call their conversation profile. I'm sure Rita can appreciate that where, you know, what, what is, how do they best want to interact? Is it email, is it text, is it chat, paper? Um, you know, the, the, I always say the demographic uh, for healthcare is the world. So we then personalize payment options for the patient by matching their capacity to pay with their conversation profile so we can engage patients in the best way to drive response. And uh, then lastly, of course, you know, kind of completing the machine learning loop uh, we're measuring outcomes, and that, that's never more important during this pan at the height of the pandemic. Uh, we need to inform our system on behalf of the hospital uh, on future interactions. Did they pay in full? Did they need a payment plan? Did they default on their plan? Um, and it's really about coordinating the automation and machine learning to uh, is it's a critical critical component to um, you know compete for that patient's attention and be responsive to their needs. 
Good. Sammy, you are in some ways kind of looking at this at a 30,000 foot level, right? You, you are collecting data and, and analyzing that data um, and trying to make some sense of it, not just on a US basis, but on a global basis. Um, what, when you stop for a moment and say, maybe this thing is close to ending, I'm, I'm thinking US centric, what, what, what are the key takeaways that you have about what has transacted over the last 14 months? Yeah, thank you, Brian. Yeah, so the, the lens we bring to this is more of a public health lens. And what we're really interested in is how can the response, the public health response be more precise? Because we know that COVID is not impacting every community or person in the same way. And how can it be more equitable? Um, in terms of um, what are some of the lessons learned, I think one is, you know, it's really important to be a few steps ahead of the virus, so to say. Uh, I think um, during this pandemic, we have been really living in the moment and reacting to the situation. Um, and so, for example, early on, you know, to address this gap, we built um, an index called the COVID community, COVID-19 um, Community Vulnerability Index, which is really aimed to help policymakers understand which communities are going to have the worst outcomes. And when we mean outcomes, we mean not only health, but also social and economical. As we know, the impact of this pandemic has been way beyond health. Uh, and an index like this has gone, you know, super granular and has been used by, you know, the CDC, Departments of Health, private public partners. Um, but related to that, I, what I would say is one of the things that was really surprising to us is the lack of granular data, is the lack of pandemic preparedness uh, response data. And, and if you look at the landscape, a lot of this data void was filled by actually smaller, more nimble organizations like uh, JHU, COVID Act Now, the COVID Tracking Project, ourselves. Um, so I think there's a lot here we can learn in terms of how can we really prepare better for the future pandemic and make sure we have the information that we need proactively rather than reactively. So let, let's stay with that, Sema. The, the, um, the, this notion of the disparities. I mean, we, the US News, we have a an index of community health. We, we, we survey all 3,000 counties and, and certainly the lessons we've learned in the few years we've been doing that um, is that there are wide, wide disparities. Some of them related to wealth, some of them related to other factors, but um, nothing made that more apparent than what has transpired in the last 14 months. Kevin, I know you, Penn is an interesting institution geographically. You sit in a one of the major East Coast cities and have uh, a huge redevelopment on one side of the hospital and you have some impoverished neighbors, neighborhoods on the west side of the hospital. How, how, has, how has Penn dealt with the, these disparities and, and tried to, to make changes there? Well, first, we, we're, we're acknowledging those disparities. And you know, we have a term, 20 blocks should not mean 20 years of life. 18th and, and uh, Rittenhouse Square, Average life, life expectancy is 80 plus, but if you go 20 blocks west to 54th and Cedar, the average life expectancy is 56. Gun violence, the, the food deserts, the uh, social distancing, which we preached over and over again. Social uh, distancing is really a 1% privilege because if you live in a multi-generational row home, you know, it's pretty hard to do social distancing. So we've tried to embrace once and for all, how are we going to fix these disparities? And it's going to start with, as Sema said, with the right data, the granular data so that we can do the right interventions. It's going to take resources, but mostly it's going to take us understanding and having empathy and meeting people in their, um, their neighborhood, their environment, again, virtual. Uh, I think Rita touched on this when we rolled out telemedicine. We did over a million visits. We thought it was a great access tool unless you don't have broadband, unless you don't have Wi-Fi, unless you're sharing a computer with. So the, the digital divide is just another form of barriers to access. And, and we as a society, we just need to acknowledge these things and, and, and get them out of the, out of the way. And um, George Floyd's uh, murder was a wake-up call for us in, in, in Philadelphia. And we've been responding every day since with a commitment to eliminating Again, trying to stay in our lane, which is health equity and health care, and trying to make sure that everybody in the city of Philadelphia and the surrounding counties 
ha has a chance to live the same life that, that I've been afforded and, and so many of my colleagues have. I mean, in the in the brick and mortar realm, you, you're you're building a new hospital. Is that is that what I'm understanding in in, in West Philadelphia? No. So it, it's a it's it's a great question. Behind me is our new 1.5 billion dollar hospital that's going to open in a couple of weeks. But in the middle of the pandemic, Mercy Hospital, 20 blocks to our, our west, was slated to close. Trinity Health announced that they were uh, going to shut down that hospital, and and we could have certainly fit our local patients into the new hospital. Rather, we decided that we would partner with local nonprofits to keep that Mercy campus open as a healthy village. Mm -hmm. so, that, so it's not just go to the ER and come back to the ER, but how do you build a primary care practice? How do you have a nutritionist? How do you have a gym? How do you have a workforce re-education center so that that old hospital, which is still bricks and mortar, but becomes not a hospital, but a, a, again, a health campus, a healthy village. Let me ask John that question. John, in terms of the equity issues, I mean, you're, you're, again, you're dealing with patients across the spectrum. What, what is your data telling you about how people are coping with this and, and the kind of pressures that are on them? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, what we see from our hospitals, uh, you know, affordability, first of all, is really the core of what we do. So. I come at this from more of a financial care perspective, um, but 47% of Americans can't pay a $400 medical bill, you know, and Kevin leads to health equity. And, you know, healthcare drives over 60% of the bankruptcies in the US. Um, so, and this is before the, the pandemic hit, so you can imagine the strain that it's putting on now. But nine out of 10 consumers want to know what they owe up front. And uh, this has really been supported by the new transparency rules that have rolled out this year, um, and it's really informed demand for offering um, to our clients personalized payment plans at a time of scheduling a registration. So um, just because they get an estimate, as an example, uh, at pre-service at scheduling, it doesn't mean that it makes it easier for them to afford it. It just gives them a chance to prepare for what the financial impact is going to be of that visit. So by having the transparency, but then also giving them a personalized way to pay over time um, enables confidence for these patients to come in and knowing that uh, they can afford the deductible portion of their expense. And it will get more patients to, I think what, you know, I'm sure Penn wants to do is get patients uh, to get care ahead of time as opposed to dealing with when it's acute. Um, and that's really what we think the payment perspective can do um, for the healthcare side of things as well. What, yeah, read on that. So a couple of questions on that. I want to I want to hear what what Mayo's position is on, on equity uh, issues, but also as John cites, I think one of the issues I've heard is that, that so many patients have deferred care, basic uh, checkups, all sorts of things, and it has really created a, a, a pent up backlog. What? How, how, what do you see at Mayo and, and how do you try to reconcile that? Yeah, we, we are seeing um, a pent up backlog, but we've had a steady flow of, of patient care um, because we were able to accommodate our demand through our virtual solutions. So we haven't seen probably as much as, as, as others. Um, but to answer your question on the digital divide um, and equity, um, I, I sit, I'm sitting 15 minutes away from where George Floyd was murdered, um, and our community obviously was uh, impacted tremendously, um, and, and, it, and it created sort of an explosion of focus around how do we solve these issues in, in light of health equity, in light of the impact um, of COVID. And I would say the issue of the digital divide is really seen through the broader lens of diversity, inclusion, and equity more broadly. And Mayo Clinic has deepened our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a $100 million commitment made in 2020 to fight racism within our walls, but also within our communities. Um, I came across an interesting article, um, though, uh, that I think is important as it relates to the digital divide. Um, I read this article on HIMSS. It was the digital divide in healthcare. It's not just access. 86% um, of more than 70 million uh, Americans on Medicaid have a smartphone. Um, young Ameri Americans of color, they have access and post on social media more than their white counterparts. 
And so when we think about the digital divide, I think it's really important to think of underserved communities um, as active users of technology, but there is still a gap in solutions tailored to older people or to specific language to um, uh, articulate um, um, solutions and opportunities that are conscious of cultural context, um, as well as the how do we address low digital literacy overall. And then specifically about broadband, we do have challenges with rural access. And so Mayo Clinic is, is very active in advocating for um, broadband infrastructure across the nation to support and serve all. Um, one other point about inclusion and the digital divide that we don't talk about enough in terms of our solutions, uh, our digital solutions, is making sure that we have accessibility for people with visual um, and physical um, different varying levels of, of abilities. And so that's something that I think groups of people were missed throughout this pandemic as we think about our new solutions in the next phase of how we solution this, how do we make sure that we can talk to include all in our digital solutions? Right, I mean, there, there does seem there's a communications problem that we've seen, I, I think specifically about the vaccine question mm -hmm. where there's all kinds of information out there that, that people are getting from who knows where anymore you know, in the old days at US News, we were one of the key news magazines and you had a few newspapers and a few network news shows. We were the gatekeepers of information and it was a great job, believe me, I loved it. You know, we could hopefully give people a very careful, accurate information. That doesn't exist anymore. People can get information from a thousand different sources. What's the role of the healthcare sector in, in trying to inform people. And I'm gonna stay with you, Rita, and then move, move it to, I wanna hear from, from all of you guys, because I think intersecting with patients and consumers is a key part of what everybody's role is here. But talk, talk you're, the, you're the communications person at, at Mayo. How can you get everybody to get the right story? Yeah, I th misinformation is, is a critical challenge. Um, and just using Mayo as an example, we have one point, over 1.5 billion visitors to mayoclinic.org to find healthcare information. Um, how, how we focus and support is making sure that we are partnering with lots of different endpoints or channels so that we can provide trusted information to those channels. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is making sure that um, healthcare, the voice of healthcare providers um, are getting in front of patients that are, um, you know, you can tell I'm more of, I have that marketing lens, but how do we help dominate um, making sure that that information is accessible when people are searching for that information and um, non-trustworthy sources aren't dominating that conversation. Yeah, Samit, let's talk about, does, does information show up in, in the sort of studies you're doing and what what's the, consequence of that. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, actually, today we just released uh, the results of a, of a massive uh, national survey that we did. Uh, this is over a number of months, but the last uh, one on, a, on, the, on the Facebook platform so we can get a, a large number of two people. So 20,000 people and granular information all the way down to the state and soon to be county. Uh, I think what's important um, here is that when we look at, for example, the vaccine uptake and why are people not taking up the vaccine, it's not just misinformation. It, there's actually a diverse group of people. And one of the things that we've done is actually, you know, barring from the private sector, segmented people living in the United States into different segments based on what are their underlying beliefs and barriers. And we found that there are four types of Americans. Uh, one type are the enthusiasts. I'm sure a lot of the people on this call who couldn't wait to get the vaccine. But then following that, there was a group called the Watchful who wanted to actually wait and see. They, were, they had high intentions, but they wanted others to get it first. But the three others are the most interesting. Um, one is a group that's called the Cost Anxious, who despite having health insurance, believe that there are cost and time barriers to getting the vaccine. Uh, another one um, was the system distressors, which distrusted the health system. And then the third one, the skeptics, which essentially are the ones who believe in a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, now, I think the, the, the real key point here is that, you know, to be able to, for example, you know, going back to the provider patient engagement, a provider is going to have different types of patients walk into their office from these different groups. And so how can a provider 
tailor that communication to the type of patient that he or she sees, right? If someone is walking in and has time issues, you don't want to be talking about, you know, misinformation and, and factual information because they already know, but they just can't take time off of work. Um, so I think, I think this kind of granularity and level of information is very useful because as I said, you know, this pandemic has highlighted the diversity, not only in the barriers, but also in the types of people and in the inequities. And so I think, um, there's a lot we could do with, with information like this in, in making sure that that interaction is, is positive. And the final thing I'll say is that the other thing that our survey highlighted is that medical providers are the most trusted across all groups. Uh, so I think there is a huge role uh, for the medical system and for providers, doctors and nurses to actually play in the space of the pandemic, which is getting high vaccine coverage. Kevin, when we were talking earlier, we you said I was saying, you know, is this over? And you said, no, we have a lot of patients uh, already. And the key factor is uh, a significant increase in vaccinations. Um, how how is that going to happen with with that those constituencies that Sema just talked about, which seem pretty pretty hardcore on some on some levels? No, uh, certainly. Um, I so much appreciate both what Sema and Rita were saying because it, it, it encapsulated a lot of what we've been coming up against. I think we're going to go about it in a, a, a couple ways. One, we, we've created a new institute, and this would be right in, in Rita's sweet spot of uh, communication. You know, I, I can go to my my family, and they said I just read on the internet that you know there's a microchip in in your shoulder, or it's going to change your DNA, and you're going to get lymphoma down the road. And I can cite Cell and Nature and all these scientific journals, but no no one's reading those. So we need a new position in healthcare. That's a translational communicator that can take those rich scientific, I'm not, nothing against some of the talking heads on TV, but taking those rich scientific articles and being able to break them down into lay, lay person's language and, and more effectively communicate. And we're doing that in science with translational science from bench to bedside. I, I think we need from medical journal to lay person. We, we need that, that translator that, uh, um, a lot of what, again, Rita mentioned. I think Sema's point is also so important. And the only way I know how to overcome the skeptics is through much more interpersonal relationship. And I think as a society, we've given up some of the, uh, the old town, you know, let's debate a topic. And, you know, you'll, you'll text somebody a topic. You'll, you'll send them a link to your favorite website, but you won't sit down and have that, that conversation. And we have found as we've done pop-up clinics, as we've gone forward, you know, having, having somebody that the employees and the neighbors trust telling them and talking through what the issues are, it, it's an investment of time, but I think it's the only way you're gonna turn the corner on the, the skeptics and the, the, the system disruptors. Um, and, but it's, a, it, it's not an e easy solution. But, but, John, is there a role for a company like yours? Uh, I mean, you're you're at you're in the payments business, and vaccines, specifically vaccines, are free. But it, is there a role in intersecting with people and saying, "Hey, have I got a deal for you?" Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I would say we're more in the engagement business here than the uh, the payment business. I mean, you know, in healthcare, uh, payment is really the result, right? The hard work really happens to get patients to pay. I mean, over. You know, 40% of patients don't pay. They end up in collections or litigation, all the things that, you know, no health system wants. Um, one of our largest customers, they have, uh, you know, 100 hospitals across four different EHRs, highly complex. Um, and it was really the flexibility to adapt rapidly uh, that was most critical, critical to them during when the pandemic hits. Um, their patients' capacity to pay dropped. So, so what we helped inform them of is essentially uh, what's their employment status now versus a month ago? Uh, what is their income and how should they be engaged in terms of the balance they owe? If you send a balance for $1,000 when this patient can afford $50 a month, um, all you're doing is exasperating the problem. So that engagement is really what uh, plays a huge role in what we do for the hospitals from a financial perspective. And then one other thing I'll mention, because you mentioned, Brian, like getting the message right, um, one of the things that I think administratively, a lot of the financial executives at the hospitals have been dealing with is the price transparency rules, 
uh, putting charges and costs out there that will never ultimately be what the patient is going to be asked to pay. Um, so they, you know, sort of, in my opinion, rush these rules out without having a sound plan for getting the right message out to the patient in terms of what they're going to owe through an estimate, which I think should be required before it goes to the patient. Um, and then taking these estimates and going downstream to inform the patient what they're going to owe. So I think those things in terms of getting the messaging out right in real time, not uh, because you have a balance due from a patient, um, is really critical in terms of uh, connecting with the patients. Yeah, the price tra transparency, that is a sensitive question in the industry. R Rita, can you, do you have uh, a take on, on where Mayo is standing on that? And then I want to ask you, Kevin, about mm -hmm. price transparency, because it, it, it seems to be an unresolved issue. Yeah, so uh, so I'll answer it sort of in, in two ways. Um, my lens is always around um, patient perspectives, um, but um, obviously uh, making our uh, pricing available uh, and having price transparency is, is required and, and publishing that is, is critical on our, our website. But I think what's more important than just publishing it is over time, how do we make sure that it's usable and meaningful for our patients so that they can help make decisions. And I think that's the next wave that's important to focus on. Yeah, Kevin, what's where's Penn on that? No, I'm very close to, to read. I think compliance with the, the regulation was pretty easy. The intent of the regulation uh, of actually doing what John suggested where, where patients could become more consumers and have a better control over the spend. We're, we're still a long way from there, but you know, uh, executive salaries, when they got published on 990s, you know, it, it revealed to the workforce how much, you know, the leaders of the organizations get paid. We shouldn't be afraid of what we charge. And, and you know, we should, we should put it out there. And, and, you know, we need to work again on the intent more than the technicality of the law. Yeah. Um, good question. We've got some questions coming in, and obviously I want to encourage people in the audience to, to submit questions, but this is sort of on point with the information issue. Um, many health providers have reported, no, I'm sorry, that's the other one. Um, how have your organization seen community health workers and our, and, our, and our community partners play a role in translating technical medical speak and building trust with the community? Uh, where is that partnership with the community status these days? Anybody want to take that? I'll start with community health workers. We employ over 100 in West Philadelphia, and they were integral to us getting the, the message out. And they, they are a trusted source. They, they know how to, where to meet people in their environment, who to talk to, which is sometimes not the, the young man's parent, but an uncle a cousin, a neighbor, because they, they have a better relationship. So we very much tried to use the community health workers through this pandemic and as we approach health inequities. The, the other thing that, that we developed was a, a chat bot to answer questions around COVID. And the medical students, since they weren't in rotation because they were banned from the hospital, the medical students actually got together and, and role played, what questions are people gonna ask and how can we put together an answer? It's not so technical they don't follow or so sparse on detail that they don't get the information. So I, I think there's a lot, as John and others talked about, around APIs and, and more, more traditional methods of, of technology uh, uh, communication than the health systems generally have used. I like your idea of the translation. I think we could employ a lot of unemployed journalists uh, to do that. Maybe we could retrain them. Um, so, uh, Rita, any thoughts on, on Mayo and, and community interaction? Yeah, very similarly. Um, obviously, the uh, community health workers and partnerships were critical uh, in the communities that we serve. Um, from my vantage point, it was all about focusing on making sure that we have the right content and services uh, and information available uh, that can be consumable and shared out through either mayoclinic.org or our news network. Um, again, making sure that people have mo the most up-to-date and accurate information. Yeah. So let me, I want to, I want to turn to this, to the subject of money. I mean, we've been talking about patients' money, but I want to talk about government's money. Um, as somebody, you know, I'm, I'm in Washington, I'm a lifelong, I, I live in the Beltway Swamp um, and follow money on, on Capitol Hill very closely. Um, 
there is a lot of money that has been allocated to aspects of COVID, uh, more than I would have imagined possible at, a few years ago. But my question to all of you is, where is that money going? Is it going to address the problems that we have articulated here? Um, or is it, and is it enough? Um, pretty, pretty broad. Maybe some of you can, you're seeing again, from your perspective, uh, and we can get into the weeds in terms of how much is flowing into these institutions specifically, but how, how do you, is, are we addressing some of these mega issues with mega dollars? Yeah, there's definitely uh, good amounts of money being poured in uh, into this, which is great. I think, is this going to the right places? We'll have to see. Uh, I think it's too early. But however, I think there are some bright spots. So for example, um, CDC's biggest uh, disbursement or to be dispersed um, grant funding is $2.5 billion, uh, which has been alloc allocated to actually address inequities in community uh, in terms of the COVID impact. And we've actually worked with CDC to make sure that uh, we provided them the data to make sure that those um, grants are going to the right communities. Um, so I think I think there's some some really good signs in the economic recovery as well. I think we want to make sure that communities that have had the, the worst impact uh, from the economic perspective actually get the privilege of getting some of those economic recovery. So I think my short answer is there's a lot of money. There's some good bright spots and we'll have to see and monitor actually, you know, how, how this plays out in the next few months. Mm -hmm. Kevin, I mean, tremendous cost pressures on, on big inst institutional systems early on in COVID. I mean, I, you know, dollars flowing out the, <laughs> out the door. Ha has that situation rectified and, and is, you know, are, are you able to, to sort of re regroup here? Yeah, so I, American healthcare from a hospital perspective, the haves and the have nots are just continuing to spread farther apart. And, and you see that through, through COVID and it was a, primarily locally treated disease. They didn't come to academic medical centers. You went to the closest neighborhood because you had a cold, you had, you had, you had a, a flu. And, and it just put inordinate pressure on rural hospitals, on, on hospitals that were having difficulty financially before. The, the answer to the question on the, the money flow, you know, Congress and the AHA came out with a formula. Uh, you know, formulas are easy to administer and you don't get criticized. I'm not sure they directed the money to the absolute hospitals that, that needed it the most. And I was grateful for what we received. And, um, you know, I'm not, not, I'm not bashful about it, but I would, have, I would have appreciated a little bit more targeted investment in, in those hospitals that are on the, the financial brink uh, and, mm -hmm. and that COVID has, has put some pressure on. The only other thing I would say, Brian, is what I mostly worry about is the, the spend is a stimulus package and not a sustainable package. So America, we don't know how to do broad gene sequencing. So we don't pick up the variants through the, the CDC. We pick it up through a series of university labs and other places. And I'd much rather us see, let's build a sustainable gene sequence. And so for the next pandemic, we, we know what the variants are and we're ready to, to treat them. Uh, again, as opposed to sprinkling the money around. Right, John. Are you seeing that with your clients that there's some real disparities in terms of in terms of money availability? Uh, you know, I, I really can't speak to that for, for my clients. I mean, you know, our biggest role with their, um, I think, the biggest urgency has come from is 30 percent of overall revenue now is from the patients, and uh, you know, increasing our job is to help them uh, bring revenue in and money through the patient side of things. Um, so that's definitely been a high urgency for them that we're helping with. But, um, you know, and, and I guess the other thing that I would, I would mention is that, you know, when, when, you know, when the, when the hospitals first, um, before the pandemic, this was a focus, but the urgency and demand now clearly has, uh, been picked up tremendously. And that's been good for our business, but ultimately it's been good for the industry as a whole, because, you know, back when patient liability was 10% of the overall net patient revenue, you can send a statement and you can try collections and write it off. That's just not sustainable anymore. So, yeah, I want to stay with you, John. There was a question I wanted to ask earlier, but, you, you know, because Flywire is not just in the healthcare industry. You, one of the things I was intrigued is you have this a, a broad mixture in what travel and, um, and, and other sectors, education, I think, as well. 
which is part of what we're talking about here. What what do you take coming from that broader perspective? What do you see as as essential for the industry going forward here? Well, yeah. So you know what we see and what we truly believe is that really software is what drives value in payments, right? And uh, this is especially true in the complex verticals that we serve: um, education, travel, healthcare. Um, and we have a common platform that allows us to share capabilities uh, that apply to all consumers. Um, so in healthcare and education, for instance, there's a lot of similarities that people may not recognize, uh, particularly with the third party dynamic, third party payer dynamic. In healthcare, you have the health insurance, education, you have uh, financial aid, right? And they both lead to ultimately high consumer out of pocket that's dif difficult to afford. So. We actually introduced healthcare automated payment plans, uh, which was based on our solution for education because this has been done with student tuition for years. Um, and also um, in education, students have to pay upfront, you know, to keep their seat in the classroom. And this has also been pushing that level of learnings has really driven to our pre-service um, offerings to set up plans off estimates, which none of the EHRs provide today. So. Um, we definitely, you know, benefit from um, how consumers react in other verticals, how they pay, offering different payment options from Apple Pay to PayPal, et cetera. Um, and, and by driving that common payment platform, it certainly helps us serve healthcare better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. Um, Rita, what, this is a question um, from the audience. Um, what clinical innovations have come out of or been accelerated by COVID-19? Um, particular focus maybe on cancer research um, or the development of other COVID vaccines? Or, or, or can you give us some insights about where Mayo is on that? Yeah, so, you know, obviously from my vantage point, I'm focused on a lot of the uh, digital patient solutions, uh, but Mayo Clinic has had um, numerous um, clinical uh, innovations over the, the course of the year, uh, in particular in partnerships with, with many, many others. Um, one of the programs that we've had that in particular for cancer is expanding our remote patient monitoring program for uh, uh, cancer patients. And that's been extremely successful. And we were able to measure the impact of readmittance and, and other um, uh, measures successfully. Um, we also um, have leveraged our Mayo uh, Institutional Review Board um, which prepared to activate studies compliantly using virtual and virtual-based uh, meetings and social distancing safety measures. And uh, our IRB prioritized and expedited protocols and increased meeting capacity and volume to successfully launch interventional studies uh, using experimental therapies, including con convalescent plasma, um, as well as antiviral drugs and monoclonal um, antibody drugs. So as a result of the pandemic, Mayo Clinic has streamlined our processes, accelerated our study activations, and some of those remotely, but also maintaining human subject uh, protection. So those, those are some of the things that we did um, during the pandemic. A lot going on. Kevin, what about it, Penn Med? Sure. Um, we're very proud at Penn Medicine that the, the foundational platform of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine was created at Penn. And I think it's a lesson for America. 23 years ago, when Drew Weissman and Catalina Carioca started working on that, they had no idea that they were going to come up with a solution to a pandemic, you know, a quarter of a century in the future. So it, it's a rapid innovation that Rita talked about, but it's also, as a society, we need to remain deeply committed to basic science research because that, that's what's going to uh, go forward. And Drew is now working on a, a universal spike protein. Uh, vaccine. And, you know, last year when the novel coronavirus hit, there were six other coronaviruses circulating in Philadelphia. So coming up with a vaccine for every one, as opposed to is there one universal for all coronaviruses. And it, it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of time and energy, but they're worthwhile pursuits. Yeah, I thought it was, you know, interesting that there was a sort of a uh, a mythology that this vaccine was invented over the weekend. Uh, I guess it was mapped over the weekend, but but as you say, it was decades of work that had gone into the foundation of it. So um, we'll keep doing that. We <laughs> I'm going to ask about the next one, but um, Sam, I want to ask you because you come from a global perspective here. We're 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 going to have to 
reconcile how we've done here in the U.S. versus elsewhere. What, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, so if we look at um, the U.S. response, I mean, this last phase, I mean, there's so many factors, but this last phase of the vaccine rollout and delivery has, has been phenomenal. Uh, but we fumbled and stumbled quite a bit in the early phase of the response. Um, I think for me, the big lesson here is uh, a few. One is really the weakness of the public health infrastructure in this country. Um, it is, you know, I think that's what the, this pandemic has revealed that our public health systems are weak, they're not resourced, uh, they're not innovative enough, and they're not nimble enough in the way they can respond. So going back, for example, to that comment about community health workers, community health workers in low and middle income countries are the backbone of the public health system. They are professional, they're there in every community, Whereas in the US, we, we had to really scramble to be able to put up a community health worker. I mean, I know that you know, various health systems have, but at, at, a, at, a, at a public health system level, even to do appropriate contact tracing. Uh, so I think number one is that the public health system really needs to be strengthened because we're not ready for the next pandemic. Number two, and this is not a sexy answer, um, coordination is so important. You know, We never really had a national strategic plan. This wasn't transparent, this wasn't, you know, adapting as we went. And there was very limited coordination between states, within states, up and down the system. Um, so, you know, both in terms of levels, but also between health sector, um, you know, the law enforcement sector, the social sector, the housing sector. Again, globally, whenever there is any response to whether it's HIV or TB, all of these sectors come together and meet on a weekly basis at the village level, at the city level, at the county level, at the state level. So I think, um, I think some of the solutions that I'm proposing are really the backbone of a, of a good preventative public health system, which, which I hope you know, we've uh, learned from this and, and will build in the coming years. And, and what about other countries? I mean, who do you look to you think is a model of, of having managed this properly? I don't know if there's one country that has managed the whole thing properly. <laughs> I think we can le learn from many countries that, you know, even countries that feel like they've won it early on, like Germany or India have stumbled later on. Uh, I think there's a few lessons, right? Countries that have centralized health systems have done really well in being able to get out the vaccine quickly. I mean, the US is, is, a, is a different example, but I think countries that have a, a good social contract between state and community have done really well in early phases of the, of the, of the pandemic in terms of being able to wear masks, social distance. Uh, so I think, I think we really need to learn from all countries and come together and say, what is the blueprint um, for the next pandemic for any country to be able to do well? Famous quote, I think it might be from World War II, that's to the effect that the U.S. eventually gets it right after it does everything wrong. So uh, uh, hopefully we can avoid that next time. So, so that, that does lead, to, well, I'm going to get to my last question, but I do have a couple other audience questions I wanted to ask. Um, this is, um, uh, again, from the audience, many health providers have reported a sharp rise in demand for mental health services, which is expected to be with the industry for many years to come. How are your organizations approaching this? And may, maybe I can, I'm going to start with Rita and ask particularly about the, the telehealth component. Is, is, I mean, I, how are you, see, are you seeing a rise in mental health? Certainly the premise, but also is that something that lends itself to telehealth as a solution? Yes, yeah, so, so I think we're all sort of seeing a rise of, of mental health challenges uh, over this period of time. What we're seeing is a, a really strong adoption of telehealth uh, for men mental health providers, and especially as um, many people across the country have moved to different locations away from their workplace, we're finding the ability to treat patients um, that we would normally be able to treat as they, as they move across state lines. And so um, it's been an interesting test on uh, the, I think the effectiveness of tele telehealth for mental health, uh, but there's lots of innovation happening in the space in terms of really strong programs um, and digital applications to support this. Um, one, of, one of the ones um, I'm aware of is Ginger, and it's an application that's been very successful, especially for younger um, employees uh, who can uh, text their providers um, so that they have a lot more privacy um, as they're communicating. So I think it's a space that at least if from a technology uh, perspective, it will continue to grow and be more accessible and I think help remove some of the stigma um, that's associated with it. Mm -hmm. Kevin, are you seeing a rise in mental health? Uh, we, we, we certainly are both stressed within our workforce 
fatigue, separation, all the, all the things that um, uh, Rita mentioned, the digital platform may, may be the greatest thing that comes out of the pandemic in terms of its health and tone in uh, uh, behavioral health. So, you know, like a lot of places, we have our own behavioral health app and it triages uh, the patient to a rapidly increasing. So maybe you need to listen to Yo-Yo Ma for a little bit. Maybe you need some mindfulness training. Maybe you need a, a licensed social worker, a clinic psych or a psychiatrist, but it gets you there much quicker than the old fashioned way of calling for an appointment. And when you're in crisis, you need to talk to somebody then. And I think the digital platform it, you know, uh, maybe the providers are asleep in Philadelphia, but in Minnesota they're awake, or in Scottsdale they're awake, or San Francisco, and across the globe, as, uh, as Sana said. And you know, we we need to do a better job of, of getting more rapid, quick access uh, for behavioral health issues. Yeah, you you touched on on your workforce, Kevin, and that's a question that I did I wanted to get to. I mean, one of the, I mean, obviously the healthcare frontline workers are have been heroes. We have a series at U.S. News called Healthcare Heroes. And, um, but, but how, how are we doing now? How are, are you, are, are they coping? Are you, are they back to normal? Give, give us some insights as to what that terrific workforce is, is like today. So I, I don't think normal will ever be normal again. And, and we talk about COVID accelerated trends that are already underway. So I think the workforce has a much sharper focus on their, their work-life balance. You know, we're having younger doctors saying, you know, I, I don't need to make as much as I want to before I need a little more, more time at home. We have people, can I, can I stay home and work remotely? Uh, so, you know, we, we have a flavor for every, uh, with 42,000 employees, every situation. But I, I think there's a, a reemergence in, in uh, society of, are, are, is work meaningful? Is it intrinsically valuable to me? It, does it motivate me? And how does it fit into my, my larger social construct, including my family? And, and recall last April, you know, people were going home and they were changing in the garage and showering out in the backyard because they were afraid to go into the house. I mean, it, that permanently changed, I, I think, how people view uh, their family and how they interact and, 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 and the like. So the workforce is doing great, but they've been forever changed by the pandemic. Rita, give us some insights in the, on Mayo and the workforce there. Yeah, I'd love to hop in. So I joined Mayo Clinic six weeks before the pandemic. Um, and I was on the Rochester campus and I was immediately sent home. And in fact, um, very early on in the pandemic, there was a, a, a decision to move um, what we call shared services, um, non-direct patient care off campus and, may, and make a permanent decision for majority of those roles to be permanently remote. Um, it, 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 uh, while it was challenging <laughs> to learn Mayo Clinic uh, from my, my home in Minneapolis, um, it really did um, highlight the enduring values of an organization, the ability to um, onboard and understand how an organization functions and making sure the infrastructure is there to support that. So we reacted um, because there was an immediate need, but how do we make this sustainable? Um, and coming from a digital space, many people might say, oh, you know, um, working digitally using all these great tools is normal, but I come from a space where your engineers, your product people, your designers are all in the same room on a whiteboard working together. And we were, you know, trained that that's the right agile way to do work. And what we learned is there's lots of tools to make us productive, but how do we make sure we sustain our culture? And how do we stay in our relationships? And how do we remain close um, to our patients and their needs and the physician needs? And so it's been a work in progress to understand how to do that. Um, and I think we've gotten uh, closer, but I can't wait till we get back to a more of a hybrid working model so that we can be together when we need to. Um, but it's great to be able to um, hire talent all over the nation and potentially all over the world uh, because we switched our model. Right. Well, it's great to have all you guys on camera at the same time here, which would have been hard to do if we had to sit in a hotel room in Washington. But um, Sema, do you have any thoughts about the future of the, the industry? What impact this has on, on the provider side? Um, I can talk about the public health sector, if, if that's yeah. okay. 
Uh, sure. I, I won't talk about the the care industry. Um, I, I think I think there's a there's a lot here. I think we've over this last one and a half years, we've built um, collectively actually so many resources and tools, uh, and I think we have an opportunity to actually bring all of this together and create a blueprint of how do we prepare, respond, recover for the next pandemic. Um, I can see very easily us getting out of this and going, oh, great, we're done, we solved this. Another pandemic may be here in 10 years, right? Or, or in 20 years, uh, and we should not forget. So my hope is that, you know, as we come out of this slowly, we actually capitalize on all of that infrastructure, those learnings and those tools that we bid and really put something solid in place that is ready to go if and when the next pandemic hits. Um, that's my goal. Okay, John, I mean, Sema framed it, what's next? What's next for, for you guys, for your company, the industry and your perspective on, on the industry as a whole? Well, I mean, I think one positive thing that has come uh, silver lining from the pandemic is how health systems have more rapidly adopted technologies that were already there. Right, you know, telehealth was one of them. That's not a new technology; it just hasn't been used much, right? Um, and we've seen a dramatic shift overall in digital to meet the patient demands. So uh, that's really important. I think having these technologies, being able to start um, engaging in, in, from a financial perspective, uh, patients in a completely different way, so that when there is a crisis that's unpredictable. Uh, being able to adapt to that for the patient one by one, as opposed to in groups of financial class, um, is really what I see more and more hospitals preparing for, for not even just the next pandemic, but for just uncontrollable circumstances. So um, that, that's that been really what we're, we're seeing is, is, is getting your technology sort of, you know, up to par so that you're ready for what's next. All right. Rita, what's next for Mayo? Are you ready for the next pandemic? ready for the next pandemic, but we're also thinking about the future. Um, and we've learned a lot through this process. We have lots of great point solutions across the continuum of care, but now we want to have an integrated, seamless experience um, that is, is making sure that we can extend our Mayo model of care globally. And so we'll be looking um, to make sure that we, we can do, we can serve at the best of times, but we can serve effectively and efficiently uh, when we have challenges. Great. Kevin, you get the last word. What's, yeah, what's I, I think the challenge that we all face is not to allow muscle memory to pull us back to the way we used to do things, but, but rather embrace the, the fact that it's been, you know, just an incredible 18 months. And how can we make it better? How can we stay at home, hospital at home? How can we use the technologies that, that John mentioned? How can we be more global, as, as Sema mentioned, in, in terms of the virus knew no no county lines and new new state lines, but we, we have an infrastructure that is very county public health centric. So how do we, again, get away from the way we used to do it and, and keep pushing forward into what I'm optimistic about the future, but you know, we shouldn't miss this opportunity to change. Well, that's terrific. I really appreciate the time and the insights that you brought, Kevin, Sema, John, Rita. Um, a lot more to, to learn here, but I think this is a great start. I'm not throwing all my mask collection away, but I am feeling better and I'm feeling better about what happens next. I think, uh, I, think I, I appreciate that, that all of you folks have leaned into this and uh, helped us get through it. So thank you all. We look forward to seeing you in person soon. Thank yeah. you to our audience and see you all next time. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.